Charles II was known to have ruled with one of the most hedonistic courts in English history. But the story of his countless affairs, flings, and one-off trysts with both aristocrats and commoners alike isn't interesting because of his promiscuity, but of how charming, extravagant, intriguing, and industrious were the subjects of his amorous entanglements. Welcome to Nutty History, and this is the tale of what life was like as a mistress in the royal English court of Charles II. Proud and Prosperous Prose May 29, 1630 was a peculiar day in the history of England. The day the sky witnessed an unusual but brilliant brightness. It was most likely a supernova explosion as the royal queen Henrietta Maria gave birth to their first surviving son and the first heir to the combined crown of England, Scotland, and Ireland. Charles II had a rough childhood as a son of the king who failed to subdue a parliamentary insurgent in his realm, but Charles II made up for it in his adulthood big time. But to compensate, he took full privileges of his royal heritage and inheritance to create a self-indulgent court with copious amounts of a carnal merry-go-round of flirtation, seductions, and infidelities. When the Civil War's tide turned decisively in the favor of the parliamentarian forces, young Prince Charles had to flee England to join his mother at the court of King Louis XIV in the Palace of Versailles after staying in Hague for a while. Now a small recap of Louis XIV, the flamboyant Sun King who wore severely tight leggings for his grand portrait and was the byproduct of a flourishing dynasty that got even stronger in his 72-year-long reign. The man built the Palace of Versailles, made France the cultural center of Europe as we know it today, and oh yeah, he was the biggest playboy of the 17th century. Step aside, Casanova. Charles II's mother, Henrietta Maria, was also the aunt of Louis XIV, and that's why they ended up seeking refuge in the Palace of Versailles as the United Kingdom was trying to figure out what to do after offing their king. Meanwhile, Charles II mourned for his father by falling into the decadence and debauchery that Louis XIV's court was known for. Charles basked in the open display of his cousin's indecent interest in women, and learned a lot from the French king's culture to fill the court with his mistresses and having a maitre zontite, a woman who held the position of the king's chief mistress. There was no deception or discreetness about who these women were or why they were part of the royal court. Everybody was aware that they were the sun king's mistresses and they would tell everyone all about it, if asked. They would also walk proudly to the king's chamber at night or whenever he would ask them to join him for company rather than being smuggled in as was the norm for mistresses in the past. This is why the title of Maitre Zontit was a coveted position because she was regarded as higher in status than the queen herself, ruling both the king's heart and, in some cases, his political decisions. When Charles returned to England and reclaimed the throne of his father, he decided to be more like his cousin, not his ancestors. He had already bedded several beauties over all the continent and already fathered four illegitimate children during his exile. I mean, the man was putting in work. After he took over ruling the United Kingdom, Charles would proudly show his mistresses in public who would accompany him wearing lavish clothes and expensive jewelry to look fitting to be on display as the king's mistresses. Many of these women were already married before they began their affair with the Merry Monarch. But despite the stigma, they had no shame or regret about being the king's plaything and would wear the badge of being his mistress with their head held high. More Than Pretty Faces even though the mistresses of Charles were paraded at the races, walking in London's parks, in the city boxes of theaters, and at balls and around Whitehall Palace, these women were more than just Charles's showpieces and company in his bedchamber. In modern speak, Charles II was somewhat of a sapiophile. He had a knack for recognizing capable, intelligent, and influential women who brought more than just a beautiful face and physique to the table. It is true that becoming a mistress was the easiest path to join the creme de la creme of high society for women who were not born into a noble family. But that doesn't mean all of Charles II's mistresses were in dire need to join the top echelons of English society, to survive or sustain. Some women already came from a noble background and were still proud to be a mistress of the king, while some were already successful in their careers despite not being highborn. Nell Gwynne and Maul Davis were successful comedy actresses. Louise de Carroel was an established nobility in the French royal court when she arrived in England. These women were skilled, smart, and bold enough to be socially independent in 17th century England, which was still a religiously influenced patriarchal society that was simultaneously conducting mass witch hunts. Then there was Hortense Mancini, 
niece of an Italian cardinal who also happened to be the then Prime Minister of France, who could be considered the paradigm of female empowerment of her time. The lady had the title of Duchess of Mazarin, a prolific writer, and happened to be a survivor of an abusive marriage, not to mention that her husband also robbed her of her uncle's inheritance. A renowned Italian beauty who Charles II once proposed to and could have been the Queen of England if only her uncle wouldn't have objected to the proposal. Hortense and her sister Marie Mancini were the first women in France to put their memoirs into print. Both women were partly motivated by the help that producing a body of evidence would bring to the cause of separation from their abusive husbands. That's never a good thing. Their memoirs were first published in French, but Hortense Mancini's were translated into English by 1676. After her husband managed to lock her pension, assured by King Louis XIV, she made a daring escape to Britain dressed as a man and sought her friend Louise de Roel for refuge. With help from Louise and King Charles II, Hortense would create the most celebrated salon in the late 17th century, where a royal mistresses could meet, gamble, drink champagne, and discuss science and literature on an equal footing with the men. In fact, it was her salon that introduced champagne to the English society and thus helped the beverage to become the global phenomenon that it is today. Her space was an open sanctuary to learn new ideas, hear scientific lectures, talk about the latest literature, and engage in a museum-like culture where you could handle all sorts of exotic objects and animals. Though the royal mistresses harbored a lot of insecurity and cattiness toward each other as they competed for the spot of the chief mistress of Charles II, they were all happy to leave their malice outside the salon and socialize with Hortense. Even Louise de Queroel, who would come to later regret introducing Hortense to the king, for she'd be pushed off her pedestal as the official royal mistress and replaced by Hortense, who would gladly partake in these social hangouts. The Political Gatekeepers In 1659, after a part of the parliamentary army defected to join the royalist cause in Hague, the days of the protectorate ruling the United Kingdom were anything but long. Charles II also left his base in Paris to meet his new loyalist. Now, among the soldiers was a couple named the Palmers. The husband, Roger Palmer, came from a lower-ranking family than the Villiers, which was the maiden family of his wife, Barbara. Barbara was an outlandish beauty with long, dark hair, deep blue eyes, and sensuous features. Her family, the Villiers, had paid a steep price during the Civil War for staying loyal to the throne. While Palmer was quiet, studious, and a devout Catholic, Barbara was notorious for being flirty, promiscuous, and using her charms to get what she desired. And on this trip to Hague, her eyes were on the soon-to-be-proclaimed king. She was fun and feisty, and the king was all about that. Within a few weeks of Charles II's return to England, rumors began to spread of the relationship between Charles II and a uh, Mrs. Palmer. In the summer of 1660, the Palmers moved to a house on King Street, opposite Whitehall Palace, and people were often gossiping about the music coming from the new resident's house in the neighborhood, and that the king and dukes were being entertained by Madame Palmer. The final stamp to the relationship was Charles II claiming paternity to Barbara's first daughter, Anne. Later that year, the king granted Palmer the title of Baron of Limerick and Earl of Castlemaine for services to the crown. But everyone at court knew that the Palmers were being rewarded for Barbara's services in the king's bed. This is getting spicy. Barbara immediately styled herself as Lady Castlemaine, while Roger could do nothing but sulk about his wife's infidelity and file for separation after Charles claimed to be the father of Barbara's second child. Barbara didn't mourn for a broken marriage at all, but used it as an opportunity to persuade Charles to appoint her to Queen Catherine's household as Lady of the Bedchamber. How about that for a title? For Queen Catherine, this was a huge betrayal, and she refused to take Barbara in, but the king eventually forced Catherine to accept through cruelty, isolation, and sending her Portuguese staff away. Barbara was known for being greedy and arrogant and using every trick available to manipulate Charles, including embarrassing him in front of courtiers and deploying her famously terrifying temper to get her own way. That is how she became the power behind the throne and maintained that influence over Charles for over a decade. She had gathered a following of courtiers who were hoping to exploit her influence over the king in their favor, and thus court factions began to form as others vehemently opposed her hand, guiding the throne's decisions. In exchange for favors, funding, and cooperation, she helped them get appointed to high office. Those who were against her, such as the Earl of Clarendon, were publicly denounced by her, and she tried everything she could to remove him from power. She was granted the titles of Duchess of Cleveland, Countess of Southampton, and Baroness of Nunstitch in 1670. But this was also the time when the king had set his eyes on Louise de Coroel, so maybe those titles were more of a parting gift. 
a change in regime. On the surface, Louise's move to England and becoming Charles II's mistress was a chance incident triggered by a tragedy which was the death of Charles II's sister. But there was a grand design in play to replace Barbara. Also, King Louis XIV was benefiting from the whole affair by having a French beauty right under the English throne. Unlike Barbara's formidable personality and short temper, Louise was a sensitive, polite, and polished aristocrat, which helped her to be more successful at politics as well. Rather than petty court dramas, she subtly pushed and pulled the strings of international diplomacy and politics between England and France. Whether it was the ongoing Dutch wars, the toleration of Catholicism in England, or the negotiations of Anglo-French alliances, Louise whispered gentle but effective words into Charles' ear as the big political decisions were being made. Louis XIV tried to control her by sending gifts to earn her loyalty, but as her influence and confidence grew, she often made surprising choices that either annoyed the French or amazed the English. These moves, though, benefited her short term. She also earned more enemies and friends. Still, she was dear to Charles II, and that kept her protected to play a major part in strengthening the Anglo-French alliance. While Barbara was more of a prime minister, Louise rose above petty politics and established herself as an alternative queen. Well, at least until she was caught having an affair with a young French nobleman, Philippe de Vendôme. Royal Controversies, Scandals, and Gossips With Charles II being candid about his affairs in public came a great deal of public interest in his royal mistresses. These women became the celebrities of their time, and their images and stories flooded the streets of London, thanks to an expanding reach of newspapers, poems, pictures, and ballads that were now being distributed more quickly and cheaply than ever before. Women, especially those from the elite circles, had never been displayed and presented in such a provocative way. To add to that, at least two of these women were already public personalities given they were actresses. Barbara and Charles's first mistress, Lucy Walters, were too loud to be ignored, and everybody had their eyes on Louise and Hortense for simply being foreigners. These ladies having a grand influence in the English royal court and receiving handsome pensions helped them to commission art that was also as bold and mischievous as were their affairs with King Charles II and other men in their lives. When the court painter portrayed Queen Catherine of Braganza, richly attired in silvery robes and crowned with a dramatic purple hat, Barbara commissioned the painter to paint her in the exact same manner as an open defiance to the Queen's authority. The genre favored by Baroque painters to overstate their high-born patrons into classical or biblical archetypes with heroic narratives was fully endorsed by these mistresses. But they didn't stop there. These women were known to be daring. So they went one step ahead with bravado and exposed their skin and a lot more in these paintings. While most of these paintworks were mischievous, audacious, suggestive, or marginally arousing, such as Louise having herself depicted as Lady Minerva, Nell Gwynn trumped her by having herself depicted as a goddess Venus with her fully bare body in the frame. Oh my. Clearly, these artworks were used as weapons in the battle to become the king's dearest. The competition was quite fierce too. Nell Gwynn and Maul Davies fought over the king's attention on and off stage. Maul Davis was a rising star when Nell had already found a spot in the king's arms. Threatened by the new actress's advancements towards the king, Nell mixed laxatives in Maul's food on the day she had an appointment with the king. Ooh. At the end of May 1668, Maul performed at a court event so provocative that Queen Catherine got up and left halfway through, furious that she was forced to watch her husband's mistress dance in such a suggestive way. Nell and Louise were known to verbally spar with each other every time the two met. Nell was known for her cheeky and blasé attitude and would use her wits every time to rile Louise up, who was known to be polite and diplomatic, but that wouldn't stop her from goading Nell back. Now, unfortunately, we can't say the words they would use for each other except for a few nicknames Nell used for Louise, Squintabella and the Weeping Willow. It gets even darker. I talked about Lucy Walters earlier. She was another trouble story who tried to blackmail Charles over the kids she had with him. She disrespected Charles' mother on several occasions and was accused of plotting the end of her maid. Their relationship was significant because Lucy Walter bore him a son, James Crofts, who later became James Scott, first Duke of Monmouth. The relationship was controversial, as were many of Charles' relationships with women. There were rumors at the time and later that Charles and Lucy were secretly married, but there is no concrete evidence to support this claim. Monmouth later led a rebellion against James II, Charles' Catholic brother and successor, in an attempt to seize the throne for himself. The Monmouth Rebellion was unsuccessful, and Monmouth was captured and sentenced to death in 1685. Let's get back to Barbara. She had her own fair share of public stunts because of her gambling and alcohol addiction. 
Charles had often paid her gambling debts and it was no secret to the public. But once again, the prize scandal went to Hortense, who after becoming the chief mistress of Charles II, had an affair with Charles and Barbara's daughter, Anne. Famously, the two women conducted a fencing match in St. James Park, and to spice up the spectacle, both dressed in their nightgowns. Ooh, raunchy. After the scandal, Anne's husband removed his wife from London. Supposedly, Anne pined terribly for Hortense, repeatedly kissing a painted miniature of her. This and another affair of Hortense made the king so furious he put a stop to her pension. The Sorry Tale of a Queen While these women ruled, feasted, and had a merry time with the grace of the king, there was a woman who was truly treated ill by not only most of these women but also the king himself, Catherine of Braganza, wife and queen of King Charles II. From the day the Portuguese Infanta was on her way to England, Barbara made sure to make life a living hell for her and bent the king to her devious plans as well. Many people hoped that Charles' dalliance with Barbara was simply the king sowing his wild oats before marriage. But Barbara made sure to stop her authority as the chief mistress over their marriage by having her second child at Hampton Court Palace while the king and his new queen were having a honeymoon there. To Catherine's humiliation, Charles approved of Barbara's stunt. After Barbara was replaced by Louise, Catherine wasn't happy but at least found her more acceptable than Barbara. By now, everybody was aware that the queen was perhaps unable to bear children. Barbara had six children with him and there were at least eight more acknowledged children between other mistresses. Talk about being a rolling stone! Charles admired Catherine's wit and kindness but the marital bliss was short-lived and a lot of it had to do with the king's relationship with Barbara Palmer. She faded into the court's backdrop while courtiers urged the king to divorce her so he could marry and have a legitimate heir with someone else, but Charles didn't abandon her completely. She did make a huge contribution to English culture that has become their moniker. She even made tea drinking popular, and who doesn't love a good tea? We hope you enjoyed the soap opera-like tale of the Royal English Court. If you did, please tell us in the comments, like the video, share it with others, and please subscribe so we will be inspired to find more nutty stories of the past. Thanks for watching Nutty History.